as we have already pointed out, our case is built very largely upon circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence has a validity, particularly when a number of different evidential points all lead in the same direction or all indicate the same general trend. But nearly always, any reasonable idea which a human being can hold can be assailed by another person who does not accept it as reasonable. Thus acceptance of the reasonable is not assured, and many persons will not acknowledge even factual evidence if it is contrary to their own inclinations. It is more difficult, however, to deny a fact than it is to deny a reasonable assumption. Thus we are still working constantly in our own minds to clarify in as reasonable a way as possible all of the elements of this story so that we may come to conclusions and may be able to say with good semantics, I believe that this is reasonable and I am inclined to accept it. I accept it because it is reasonable, not because it is factual. And we'll continue to search for additional reasonable points and hope always that in the course of seeking, facts themselves shall be revealed. We will take an example of our problem this evening. To start with, we are we're dealing with some European aspects of the matter. So let us take one of the most interesting and confusing problems that we have in the field of Atlantis research. And that is the effort to explain the migrations of the lemmings. Now the lemmings are a small rodent-like animal, about five inches in length, very similar to the American field mouse. The lemmings inhabit northern areas of Western Europe. And uh, normally, uh, they are like our field mice, rather difficult to find, and uh, not apparently over plentiful. But periodically, they increase tremendously in number. And on an average of from four to seven years, uh, this figure is not irregular. We have migrations of lemmings, migrations that are a little reminiscent of the story of the bird migrations at our mission of San Juan Capistrano. The lemmings suddenly increase tremendously in number. And they begin to move downward into Norway and Sweden, and they become a very serious problem. They can be counted and numbered in millions. Why they should so suddenly increase is not as yet understood. Again, we have only reasonable uh, findings, even on a scientific level. But these creatures, moving over vast areas of land, impoverish it because of their constant need of food, and they are accompanied by birds, animals, that prey upon them, so that often there is a great slaughter of lemmings as they continue this migratory course. It seems that these creatures move by a mass motion. They move with a complete purpose, a purpose for which we have no answer or solution at this time. Their general tendency is to descend from higher levels through valleys or through breaks of the land, always moving downward toward sea level. The lemmings also will swim rivers, swim lakes several miles across, and continue on their way undisturbed and uninterrupted. They multiply very rapidly, and in the course of their migration, which may take anywhere from one to three years, uh, the number of lemmings at the end of this perilous trip is often greater than at the beginning. Inevitably, the lemmings move toward water, large bodies of water, most frequently the Atlantic Ocean. And when they reach the shore of the Atlantic, they swim out into the ocean and continue to swim until they drown. No one knows why. At the end of the migration, it is not known that any of them ever turn back. They all apparently go forth together into a collective suicide. Now this migration of the lemmings 
have been the cause of considerable speculation. So we can start, of course, with folklore. The natives of the area have an idea that these tremendous increases in the number of lemmings uh, are the result of these creatures falling from the sky. There's an ancient belief that they rain down upon the earth at certain times. Also, it is held in the local areas, even now, by some of the more learned and intelligent members of the communities, that the learnings are following an ancient trade route, that they are going according to a way they have always gone, and that their original purpose was to reach an area of land now submerged. And it has been pointed out, even in scientific papers, that their general route coincides with land area that has been submerged. Apparently, the lemmings are continuing to seek a place in the ocean beyond the shore. And uh, although this place has disappeared, vanished forever, the instinct of this rodent continues unchanged. If this be a reasonable hypothesis, and it has even been accepted scientifically, it means that the Romans are attempting to convey to us in a strange way through the drama and tragedy of their lives that once upon a time they could reach land which is no longer there. That this land must have at one time been of unusual attraction to them. That they are continually seeking for it. And year after year they die trying to find it. Now, what is behind all of this? Is it merely that these creatures are pressed on by some suicidal tendency? Do they go in nature merely to die? What does this instinct mean? Does it really tell us that there is a power, a driving force behind this species of creatures? that will not change, or has not changed, but continues to send them on their way to death. Nature normally does not produce circumstances of this kind. Nature is forever adjusting for the survival of its creatures. Why then do millions of the lemmings swim forth into the ocean to die? Experience has shown that they did not have to do so. They could have turned back. Even though their migration is heavy, it is not of the type of a herd of thundering buffaloes. They are not forced by the back pressure of their own kind to drown. Any time they could stop. Any one of them could have survived the entire catastrophe, but no, not one of them does. Well, here's the answer. This has been advanced as indicated. The migration of creatures otherwise to be known, where a distribution shows that at some remote time there must have been land bridges between continents now completely divided. But these land bridges resulted in the general diffusion of creatures. These creatures change somewhat, but not necessarily totally. It is assumed, therefore, that the lemmings are following an ancient route that was a land route at the time of the Miocene period, that they have never been able to overcome the instinct to follow an old order of the Earth's arrangement. And perhaps the reason why they have continued is because they have no means of common communication. Not one can come back and tell the others. Therefore, each discovers only by dying. It is a strange and remarkable story, but it's one of the facts that tells us apparently that these creatures have always expected to find land, that they did not expect to die. Now the instinct that drives them may be of psychological importance. We have no way of knowing whether the lemmings have the thought consciousness on a lower level that we recognize in certain human culture groups. In any event, their strange little pattern, locked within their own primitive structure, is this seeking of another land beyond the water. We know that they have not been influenced by Ignatius Donnelly or anyone else. 
They are not seeking because of uh, Colonel Churchward or because of uh, any modern writer. They have not even perused uh, the uh, Timaeus and previous to Plato. They are merely obeying something, obeying a force that is irresistible. The same force that probably at one time did permit them uh, to wander into other regions and perhaps ultimately uh, bleed into what we call the American field mouse. Whatever it was, this is another natural relic which seems in many ways to be more reasonable than human thinking because we are dealing now with something totally apart from the attitudes of human beings. In the old distribution of the Atlantic continent, as in the idealistic reconstructions thereof, we also observe what might be termed the eastern end of the Atlantic Bridge. This eastern end seemingly extended reasonably to the north, certainly including much of England and perhaps further into the Scandinavian area. Whether this was a continuous area or whether there were islands and a land bridge at the northern end, we do not know. But Atlantis seems to have been bound to Europe at one time along the entire coast from what we now call the Scandinavian countries uh, to the western point of Africa. It united with what is now Spain and Portugal. It united with the western coast of France. It extended upward into the Baltic countries. It was one tremendous band of land. And when we study the old maps and compare them with existing maps, the land bridge is necessary to complete the picture, with, and create a land area in the Atlantic Ocean uh, basin about one and a half times the size of the United States of America. It would have been a tremendous uh, piece of land, a very vast area, with the Azores Islands somewhat above the center of the land, but within the general area thereof. On the western side, this tremendous continent was bound to the western hemisphere from an area north of Nova Scotia up around Newfoundland, all the way down to what we will call uh, Cape Hatteras. It then seems to have broken away and to have tipped with water between it and land downward to include most of the West Indies. We do not find absolute proof of a land bridge as far south as the uh, eastern points of South America. But we do have this tremendous area. How can we strive to increase our rational understanding of uh, the effect of this culture upon surviving land areas? Let us therefore for the moment uh, consider what seems to be a reasonable probability, namely that an attempt to escape from Atlantis, presuming that this continent was in the process of breaking up, would have been in the form of migrations over whatever land areas were available, or in narrow water areas which could be crossed by boats, rafts, or any available materials. We are not at all certain uh, that long-range preparations for such navigation could be made. On the other hand, ships may also have been available, or large canoes of something of that nature. It would seem, though, that uh, taking the Azores to be approximately the seat of the central point of Atlantean culture, though not the center of the continent, it would seem reasonable that those existing areas of the Earth's surface which were associated with the terminals of the ancient continent would be most likely to have direct relics or indications of the uh, earlier connections. 
We have, however, an entirely different problem also to face, and that is our geological problem. According to our problem today, as we visualize it, a large part of the Atlantis story should have existed about the time of the Cro-Magnon, should have existed in the great periods which we recognize geologically as those related to the emergence or appearance of primitive man upon the earth. So we study the Cro-Magnon, we study the remnants of his way of life, and such as we are able to discover about him, does not give us any distinct clue to our Atlantean culture. And here we uh, must pause and give uh, careful consideration to what might be termed negative evidence. We have no evidence that we can bring forth today out of the remnants and ruins of the past to indicate the primitive man of the Cro-Magnon period, at which period certainly Atlantis should have been there, already an existing culture, that the Cro-Magnon was equipped with any of the instruments of culture or civilization with which we associate the Atlantean. We have two answers possible to this dilemma. First is that the Cro-Magnon represented a level of primitive savagery which existed contemporaneously with a higher culture. Just as today, uh, we would not be entirely flattered if our culture was to be estimated only by the Australian Bushman. Yet he exists today. He exists in a world which he uh, is rather out of step with. And if in some remote time, uh, archaeologists should excavate his remains in an effort to determine the cultural stra uh, strata of the 20th century, uh, the um, ethnologist or anthropologist would come under a bad time. He would come to some very false conclusions. Thus, it is not as certain that the discovery of primitive man's remains invalidates the possibility of a higher culture existing at the same time especially if this culture was somewhat uh, limited from the standpoint of the area in which it developed. Plato's account cannot be dismissed with complete lightness, although again it is only fair to say that as early as the second and third century, Platonists regarded it with suspicion. It should only, however, lead us to a more thorough and careful examination of such evidence as can be accumulated. We study the Cro-Magnon, we see his primitive struggle for existence. We see him fighting the mysteries of a prehistoric world which seems to have been abandoned to savagery and wildness. We find him groping upward for fire, for shelter, for clothing. We see very little indication in his struggle of the type of culture we are seeking. Does this mean that already land areas had broken away so that by degrees the Atlantic continent had shrunk into one vast insular region which was not in contact or indirectly uh, accessible to the migrations of the primitive men of that time? Let us take a parallel of this and see how reasonable we are. In the year 1490, the Western Hemisphere, as we know it today, was comparatively unknown to a highly civilized people. In 1490, European man was not aware of the existence of the American Indian. He was not aware that between Europe and Asia was a vast continent that would someday dominate the world. Let us be a little more local in our thinking. Down in Central America, your Aztec Maya Toltec culture had practically no awareness whatever of the Plains Indians of North America. Uh, these nomadic tribes also seemingly, for the most part, derived very little 
from comparative proximity with the Aztec Maya Taltec culture. The only point where they seemed to meet and mingle was along the uh, banks of what we call today the Rio Grande. In other words, your New Mexican Pueblos, uh, your uh, town dweller Indians, your Hopis, Zunis, are the ones which show the mingling of these two cultures. But not far away, other Indian tribes seem to be comparatively unaware that a great, highly cultured civilization lay to the south. The empire of Montezuma was one of the greatest empires the world has ever known. Yet Montezuma knew nothing of the existence of Europe. Therefore, as late as the 15th century of the present era, one-third of the world was unknown to the balance, with a few exceptions, a few individuals who had had one or other way of greater contact. But these very individuals were ridiculed for their belief that such a thing could exist. Our American Indian is the victim of this misunderstanding, for the early explorers named him the Indian because they thought he was an East Indian and that they had reached Asia. Now, if this could happen in a civilization that could give us the greatness of Florence and Rome, the magnificent temples and palaces of the Near East, how much more so could this have occurred thousands, perhaps 50,000 years ago? Thus, the fact that areas were not commonly known and that various levels of culture or lack of it, could have existed uh, contemporaneously, is not disproved. We therefore have certain negative uh, findings, but they are not conclusive in any way. They only indicate, uh, perhaps, that, as has been generally suspected, the Atlantic catastrophe took place over a very long period of change during most of the Pleistocene age. But therefore, by the time that we, what we call the Cro-Magnon had made his appearance, some of the land bridges had already disappeared. And uh, the primitive man of Europe had no means of reaching uh, this larger world outside, or this tremendous complex of culture located upon its ten islands, or upon its continents and islands. This will fit also, to a large degree, into our previous concept, namely that certain cultural motions from Atlantis may have rescued the Cro-Magnon and have started him on a way to culture, for which we have at this time no adequate explanation. What happened between the Cro-Magnon and the rise of Egypt. Here is an absolute blank. We have a man crawling around, fighting saber-toothed tigers. We have him living in a cave, mumbling raw bones. We have him struggling to perfect the stone axe. We find him scratching in the unintelligible glyphs upon rock, and fishing with bone fishels. We have him striving for fire and finally attaining it, and his principal instrument of defense being a rock, which he apparently tossed with some success at monsters that have since disappeared. <laughs> we are not sure, however, that he was responsible for their disappearance. <laughs> He probably missed most of his targets. <laughs> then in a short time, we find the rise of the first dynasties of Egypt. We find a literate people, a scientifically cultured people. We know nothing about what any man was doing 10,000 years ago. For 7,000 years ago, he was building pyramids. What happened between? What suddenly moved? this mysterious missing link of Gabriel Max into what we call the pattern of progress. Something must have happened to it. Yet we have no record of what did happen to it. 
He and his surviving forms, primitive peoples of today, have no adequate record except the myths which we have already discussed. If something definitely did happen. Whatever it was gradually moved man with incredible rapidity from savagery uh, to a socialized state which already was admirable when history as we know it begins. The great Assyriologists, the great Egyptologists, the great Sinologists, none of them have any answer. They do not know what the force was that tipped man into a state of rational existence. This mystery perhaps is concealed in the biblical account of where the Adamus or the pre-Adamite man was suddenly endowed with soul, became a living soul capable of thought, capable of conscious growth. The circumstances are dim. But if we are not willing to accept that primitive man had some teacher, then we must assume that for reasons totally inexplicable, the drive to intellectual attainment broke out all over the earth at a comparatively similar if not identical time, and that this drive suddenly lifted these primordial people into a state of intellectual attainment. We look around us and we observe with great interest the rise of peoples, the attainment of intellectual individuality under the existing conditions of today. True, we do not have as many uh, primitive groups to work with. But we observe, for example, that within the last 10 years, a great change has taken place in the map of Africa. Ten years ago, we had only three sovereignties in Africa. These were Egypt, the little Negro Republic of Liberia, and the Empire of Ethiopia. All the rest of this vast continent was a colonial empire of foreign powers. Today, or very recently, in the newly liberated state of Ghana, which was previously the crown colony of the Gold Coast, eight independent sovereignties of Africa met in national conference. There are now eight independent nations in Africa. These independent nations re reflect progress, but this progress was a gradual growth through contact. We may assume that had there been no contact between Africa and other groups of culture, contact which perhaps later became a burden under the colonial policies of various European powers, but certainly the original contact and its results in the terms of schools, sanitation, the development of communications with the outside world, missionaries, many other contributions. These made possible the rise of the independent states of Africa. What happened back in the days of our mysterious Cro-Magnon? Had he been reached by other powers who had advanced lo longer and considerably in the way of independent individualism, he might well be rapidly moved to a higher social foundation. But left completely to his own devices, we do not know exactly what it was that inspired the Cro-Magnon man to suddenly emerge in the rise of the greatest classic civilizations that we know, civilizations so glorious that they are still romances of fiction in our minds. We observe, in memory at least, the grandeur of Babylonia the magnificent Ur of the Chaldees. We see the rise of great cities. We behold the wonders of Philae, at Karnak, at Luxor, and the tremendous pyramids upon the delta of the Nile. We see the rising glory of China and India. 
these things did not emerge suddenly out of the Cro-Magnon. Something had to happen. He did not have a long enough time, and more interesting, had he developed these things of his own accord and in his own simple way, we would have locked in the earth, locked in the stratas of geological formation and in the human artifacts, the unbroken record of these changes over long thousands of years. We do not have them. We do not have the evidence of the super Cro-Magnon. We do not have the indication of this man suddenly becoming the astronomer, the scientist, the physician. We do not find rising in him the vestiges of great theocratic states, the rise of knowledge. We do not find in him the seeds of reading, writing, and arithmetic. What happened? Until all these questions are satisfactorily answered, in some way, we have a right to a reasonable point of view to ask the question. And we also have a right to advance as reasonable, but not factual, such explanations as may contribute most directly to the clarification of this difficulty. There seems to be only one possible answer, that is, natural answer. If we do not wish to ascend into the entirely rarefied atmosphere of mystical speculation, the most common reasonable answers are usually the correct ones and the last to be found. And these speculations would indicate that a wise young man who grew up alone and became a scholar must have known someone who was, must have had at least sufficient contact to awaken within himself the realization of the possible directing of his own abilities. He might not have studied long with a scholar, but had he seen somewhere a state superior to his own, then he might gradually through meditation strive to attain it, having visualized it, having known of its existence, but without even the possibility of such awareness it is unlikely that he would move very rapidly. And it is very interesting to note that the story of man's rise on this planet, as far as it is recorded, is phenomenally rapid. And that much that we can hardly understand or appreciate took place within a few thousand years, whereas other processes in nature took millions of years. Thus the possibility of the existence of the hen before the appearance of the egg uh, comes to our thinking. We, of course, can fall into Aristotle's problem of regressive evasion because that previous hen requires a previous egg, which in turn supposes a previous hen, and we can go back beyond any point we wish to even imagine. The natural answer is, however, that somewhere man did have a period of growth sufficiently long to explain in terms of evolution his gradual attainments and his reasonable growth from infancy to maturity as a creature. And that this particular pattern of growth has disappeared so that we are no longer able to rescue its proportions. We can see only certain effects of it, but its own substantial nature completely eludes us. Atlantis offers a possibility, and it is also quite certain, as we have said before, that Atlantis represented a period, an epic, in the development of world cultures. General Furlong, in his Rivers of Life, attempts to show the rise of the great cultures of mankind, particularly as these refer to the seven principal streams of religion. Looking over his long and intricate graphs relating to this procedure, we observe that the general is in exactly the same dilemma. He suddenly discovers in the background of things the altars of the seven great gods, or the seven great ideas, which later arose 
and developed and became systems of theology which by their minglings produced philosophy and these minglings with religion finally resulted in the emergence of science. They will fall along and take them back so far. Then his charts dwindle out. And in his work he is unable to identify the origin of one of the seven streams with which he is concerned. They suddenly flow from hidden sources. Once they appear, they are the wonder of the ages. But where were they before they appeared? For in the intervals involved, there is no time for their maturing. On one side of this dark curtain of history, a primitive man, unlettered, unlearned. He steps through the curtain uh, like the prologue of a Shakespearean play. Behind the curtain, he is a savage. He steps through, takes a bow, he is a gentleman. How did it happen? It is not wise to assume merely magic. It is much wiser to assume that something happened which we do not know. Veritasa said a miracle is only an effect, the cause of which is unknown, but the cause must be equal to its effect. And what produced civilized man must be equal to what it produced. This we do not know. We have no way of estimating. So we circle a little bit around the European end of this great bridge to find out if we can what was happening. One of the things that strikes us, as O'Brien points out in his Round Towers of Ireland, is a, is a remain of ancient masonry in the Emerald Isle. These strange towers that look almost like Egyptian obelisks, except that they are circular. These towers belong to a kind of architecture, which today is tied into the most elaborate folklore and legendary among a people who have become synonymous with folklore and legendary. The builders of the Round Towers of Ireland, uh, O'Brien Alpines, might have been Buddhist monks. For there is a record that Buddhist monks from Asia reached Ireland at a remote period. Lord Kingsborough, in his great work, The Anacalypsis, also takes it for granted that Asiatic migrants reached Ireland at a very ancient time. How long ago? We do not know. And as we mentioned earlier, the various schools of archaeology are in no common accord as to the primitive remains in Ireland and in the north of Scotland. Another interesting group presents itself to us on the plains of England, where we have the strange mass of stones, which we call Stonehenge. This is called a Druid temple, and we've heard it until uh, we have come to believe it. Actually, the Druid remains and records, as preserved uh, in the Welsh records, records and legends, and in the account of Taliesin, and even in the reports of Caesar, the Druids at that time used Stonehenge because they regarded it as a monument created by the gods of previous ages. The Druid records tell us definitely that the Druids found Stonehenge. They did not create it. They are much like your aspects of Mexico who found the pyramids of the sun and moon, but did not build them. The stone used in the quarrying of the rocks of Stonehenge has been also a subject of great discussion. Some say that it was precipitated through the air by spirits. Well, that is helpful. Uh, and we are reminded of a root of um, the historian Herodotus who tells us that the builders of the pyramid started to build at the top and work down. This also gives us a moment uh, of consideration. We also have read recently that it was advanced as a speculation to explain the mysterious figures and heads on Easter Island, as it is now called, 
were moved by having huge stones quarried out, dropped into a volcano, which fired them out again and dropped them in convenient spots. Uh, this sounds a little too much on the order of modern rocket propulsion. Actually, all of these mysteries are mysterious for one reason only, and that is we cannot conceive a primitive man having the brains to do any of these things in a reasonable way. We are convinced that our primordial ancestors could do nothing better than throw rocks around, and small ones at that. That they were so concerned uh, trying to find fire that they never got any further. Actually, a more interesting group even uh, than Stonehenge is to be found in Brittany, in the western part of France. It is called Karnak, but it is not spelled the same as the Karnak in Egypt. Karnak is a mystic maze of stones, some of which would dwarf those of Stonehenge. But instead of a circle of stones, we have hundreds of them. Great monolithic rocks standing on end, forming rows like soldiers at attention. Why they were put there? Who put them there? No one knows. But one of our more factual friends decided that at a remote time, some native king or prince decided to hide a buried treasure. He hid it under one of the rocks and put all the others there to confuse people who were looking for it. <laughs> now, this is good, sober, factual stuff. And pretty ridiculous. These stones that were used in the building of Karnak will weigh up to 15 and 18 tons. They were moved some of them considerable distances. And like the uh, tremendous carved stones of Guatemala, they apparently were tipped into the ground at one end by digging a pit and allowing the weight of the stone to gradually drop it into the pit. After that, the opposite end was raised and the uh, part in the pit was buried and became the foundation. This happened at Easter Island, we know. It was primitive engineering, but it was successful. But what caused it? What would lead a vast number of persons, that must have been a vast number, to devote an incredible period of time to raise a, a maze of rocks into the air, 12, 15, 18, 20 feet, leave them without a carving or a sculpturing upon them. And if that isn't mysterious enough, we can look around through England, Scotland, and Wales and find all kinds of large rocks that have been balanced like the head of a mushroom on a very small stem-like rock, so perfectly that they have balanced for ages. Why? No one knows. Yet most of these tasks, though primitive, seem to bear witness to a high resolution and purpose. This purpose we get no trace of in the story of the Cro-Magnon Man. We find this pr pro problem or this purpose already exhausted by the time that Egypt began. But there is this similarity. The builders of the pyramids and the great monuments of Egypt used the same basic method, but they had highly refined it so that their achievements uh, were orderly, scientifically reasonable. Somewhere, factors had come in, yet these factors were not unknown to the builders of Stonehenge and Karnak. The Druids found that Stonehenge constituted a magnificent calendar of the equinoxes and solstices. We know that the pyramid is, on, is oriented to the 11th decimal point. It is almost certain that the great ruins of Karnak in Brittany had some definite 
scientific or religious usage. These were built by persons who already knew something. They were not built by the pro magnon but apparently they were standing there long before we come to this dark curtain which divides prehistory from history as we know it now. We also observe a number of other intriguing and stimulating lines of thought. Where it is possible to trace the physical remains of a people, we have certain foundations upon which to build. When, however, we begin to trace the psychological foundations of people, we are in a field where our own instruments are inadequate. Psychology as we know it today is only 50 or 60 years old. We are seeking now for further insight into the pressures and archetypal patterns behind the human race. We are looking essentially for the same thing the scientist is trying to find out about the lemmings. We are trying to discover the source of the pressure which we have today called progress. What caused it? What has caused it to snowball? Why is it today that progress has gradually become mostly pressure? And that under the insistences of this tremendous momentum, we are sometimes afraid that we are rolling and rumbling our way towards some incalculable doom, that we are committing suicide just as the lemmings commit suicide each time they migrate along the field or line of their own tremendous pressure. This pressure seems to always be present as a result of a cause. We may like to assume that man's pressure began totally within himself. But every experience that we know tells us that there must be two kinds of pressure. One is pressure from within and the other is pressure from the outside. That from one type, the first pressure, we discover the existence of energy resources, of power and of will. We discover that under stimulation, under incentive as we call it, man has an incredible reservoir of potential. But that this potential is only released when necessary. Uh, when conditions demand it, require it, and it prefers to be released sequentially, each step leading naturally to that which follows it. Just as the growth of the child is a sequential, regular procedure, so the growth of archetypal idea in man has been always a sequential growth. The battleship did not come first and the hollowed out log afterwards. But from the hollowed out log, man gradually learned one useful improvement after another until he was able to build a boat. But he only built the first boat or hollowed out the log because he discovered in certain areas that if he sat astride a log that was not hollow and allowed his feet to dangle in the water on both sides when he wanted to cross a stream, he was liable to lose a foot or two to a crocodile getting across. He found it necessary to protect himself against the dangers in the water. Therefore, he gained the idea of gradually lifting his feet out of the water and finding a place for them either on or in the log. And out of that gradually has come a procedure which has led to such great ships as we have today. Ships that are the inevitable development of sequential pressure within the incentive and inventive faculty of man. Therefore the Egyptian or the earliest culture groups in the valley of the Euphrates, India and China that emerged with powerful cultural patterns, emerged because of incentive and because of a long period of experimentation. Now we look back upon them and we say, but after all, they may not have needed this period because actually so many of their achievements were simple in comparison to ours. We needed their foundations, but they could never have conceived the things we would build upon them. 
There is one point of difference, however. When you educate a child, the most important, necessary, and difficult part is the first two or three years. There he must gain use of the instruments of his, ed of his own education. He must be given the basic principles, reading, writing, arithmetic, spelling. He must have these things, for without these he cannot build. And now today, in the 20th century, we are not certain how these should be imparted to him. We are beginning to suspect that our methods of teaching him are not what they should be. Therefore, primarily, the great basic discoveries required the most enormous pressure of all required the most powerful incentive and some kind of judgment upon incentive by means of which the early course of knowledge could have been clarified. We can send any child to school today, but only because there are 7,000 years of educational formula behind us. How we sent the first man to school, we do not know. Even presuming that he had the, the potential, only experience, discipline, repetition, and the orderly development of his faculties could have enabled him to make this tremendous transition within a conceivable period of time. And we have a very limited time in which he did it. And we know that we are not far off in the dating of this time. We can only assume, therefore, that what we call today the growth of man from the Pliocene, uh, from perhaps the Pithecanthropus erectus, or the Neanderthal man, or the Heidelberg man, these ancient ape-like humans, these could not be all that preceded the rise of Egypt, the glory of China, the magnificence of India, and the splendor of the Greek or Roman culture. It's just not conceivable. So we have to have something. And these incentives have to come to us from some disciplined cause or source. Nearly all your ancient mythologies attempt to explain this by stating that there were in the, upon the earth in ancient times superior races of beings. And in religion, we find them everywhere. We find them in Ireland. We find them in Scotland. We find records of them in France and England. Everywhere we search, as in the case of the Sagas and the Adas, in the case of the ancient Arabian records, the Egyptian legends, always we have a people that arose from previous contact with culture. The only difference between this viewpoint and that of the Atlantic research student is the effort to determine the estate and stature of these previous teachers. Donnelly was one of the first to present the possibility that these ancient teachers were the highly developed people of previous races. He opposes to this the presumption uh, that these were angelic beings, creatures of a superior order of life. Many mystical groups take it for granted that there were in the earth and the ancient times superior orders of beings that were not human, that were the teachers of mankind. We cannot say that this is not so. We don't want to say that. But we do say that it is conceivable that these so-called records of superior orders of beings to definitely refer to a culture then existing. Because had these beings actually been superior, we probably would not have been uh, in the presence of legends exactly like those that we have. If it was true that these 
beings that taught men were divine in the theological sense, that they were gods or angels or archangels, that they did actually represent a superhuman communication by revelation, then it is extraordinary indeed that all of these early records should be so conflicting concerning the essential integrity of these beings. We do not have at the beginning, any more than in this case of Plato's story, beings that are truly divine. We have beings in whose nature we find the elements of our common concept of a pagan theogenical uh, uh, hypothesis. Namely, we remember Zeus divine. We find him taking the form of a bull and abducting Europa. We find this same Zeus in constant argument with his wife, who was extremely jealous of him because he was by nature of a philandering intention. <laughs> this does not sound as though these old gods were divine in the strictest sense of the word. <laughs> Now we go to other nations, and they uh, are rather remain a polyglot lot. The gods of India made mistakes. The gods of China were very autocratic. They combined great gifts with strange and inconsistent attitudes. Most of the deities, for example, of the prehistoric world, that we can take uh, the Nordic Odin, for a good example, were unable to foresee the consequences of their own actions. They set things in motion and then were dissatisfied. The gods of the ancient Olympian pantheon created man, didn't like him, wiped him out. <laughs> they seem to have had combinations of factors. Among these same gods, there rose one, a great hero, a truly noble, semi-divine being, Prometheus. Prometheus took the fire of heaven in a hollow reed, and knowing that the gods were to resolve to destroy mankind, he brought the fire of immortality to man, so that the gods could no longer destroy their creation. The gods turned upon him in righteous rage, chained him to the peak of Mount Caucasus, placed a vulture over him to devour his liver, and left him in agony for ages. Peculiar. <laughs> Something not totally divine about the whole subject. <laughs> There's only one answer that appears to meet all of the problems, and that is that these myths have some ground in a reality that man, perhaps perfectly willing to accept all the attitudes and characteristics of these deities as sacred because they were beyond his comprehension, still maintained a certain record of things heard and seen. This record drifted into myth and fable. But still the record seems to show the survival of a strong humanity in the symbolism of these creating deities. That these ancient pantheons could well have represented great colonizing powers. And if you ask the man of Tunisia, or the man of Libya, or the man uh, of Algiers today, what he thinks of the nations that colonized in his areas, he is apt to give some rather mixed accounts also. There seems to be some doubt, for example, how popular the French are in North Africa at the moment. There is considerable doubt as to how popular the British were in India for a long time. Now, the intelligent Indian is perfectly willing to admit 
that he has learned a great deal from the people he didn't like. And if 10,000 years from now this whole episode is mythologized, as could occur, even our best tape recordings won't last that long, <laughs> it's quite conceivable uh, that reports concerning the ancient masters of races would be as interesting, confused, and inconsistent as those of the theologies out of the past which we hear of today. Not long ago, a considerable student of religious matters pointed out something which was also picked up and mentioned by Sigmund Freud in one of his books, namely that in religious tradition, in Europe particularly, and in the Near East, there has always been two traditions. We find this in the ancient Semitic faith, where we have the two faiths, the uh, followers of one deity, which is called the J group, following the deity we now call Jehovah, and the other called the E group, following the collective deity now called Elohim, both terms appearing in the Bible. It is quite possible, however, that although the names have since been confused, the two distinct systems of religion were originally involved. Freud thinks so. Others have also discovered a very important thing, that from the earliest religious records that we know, two religious systems have been in conflict. One is essentially monotheism, and every religion has at its root the worship of one invisible God. The other is polytheism or pantheism, the veneration for secondary deities. The, these secondary deities, in many instances, gradually obscured the primary divinity. But wherever we had the Greeks worshipping their Olympian pantheon, we also had them worshipping a secret and hidden god unnamed, superior to anything in that pantheon. And the answer might well be that originally man had a concept of an essential religion, and that this religion continued, but upon it came gradually the engraftings of the hero lines and the mythological lines due to semi-historical records. But by degrees, the ancient teachers, the colonizers, the master race of that time, became confused with deity. But the confusion was never complete. Always the concept of the one unchanging and eternal deity remain. In the Scandinavian rites we have Odin, the most powerful of the hero gods. But behind him is another deity, unnamed, only known as our father, all father, the great one, the one in whom even Odin's power was as nothing. This all father, the one behind, disappears almost completely in the great age of legendary but it is still there. So it is quite possible that what we term our colonizing continent gradually came to be confused with gods, that the mysterious heavenly world became identified or identical with the golden city of Atlantis. This was the city of the Golden Gate, the city four square. This was the wonderful heavenly city were perpetuated and remembered in most myths, but it was not necessarily the divine city, because ancient peoples, certainly Plato was well aware that the Olympian gods were not the creators of the universe. He tells us so. He shows why it is mathematically impossible that they should be. He places them, therefore, on a lower level giving them creativity over certain departments of life, but not the supreme department. The identification of the gods with stars, and the gradual development of the concept that these stars represented arts and sciences, systems of culture, and later the seven parts of the soul, and finally the sensory perceptions of man. All of these ties seem to point out that we are dealing with more than one level of ancient tradition. So we had in the religious tradition as we know it, not only a universal account of the deluge, but also the fact that this deluge swept away not only a mortal world, 
but an order of gods. In the Nordic mysteries, for example, the destruction at the Gothadamerum, the twilight of the gods, was not a destruction of the world, but of the gods. And it is inconceivable that this strange, sad, melancholy story of divine beings who were not divine, of gods who were selfish and tyrannical, of deities who brought down upon themselves a common ruin, the selfishness of the Teutonic uh, Wotan uh, when he uh, makes his, and breaks his pledge uh, to the Nibelungen. His effort to steal the ring from Fafna and all of the subterfuges involved in this story leading finally to the destruction of the gods. If they were truly gods, they could not be destroyed. This destruction therefore obviously relates if it has historical foundation, and most legends do, for mythology is the history of prehistoric time. These relate to a people regarded as sacred, held to be divine, but nevertheless subject to evil, subject to death, and subject to the ultimate dissolution of their civilization. The moment we begin to think in, the, in these terms, we begin to put together pieces that will be of considerable value to us. We know also that if the Atlantic pattern uh, gained control of European thinking, that there should be old vestiges, old remains that would tell us something about it. We find evidence supporting this uh, concept in Andalusia and in certain uh, areas of Spain. Also, we know that on rare occasions there are tides on the western coast of Spain. Uh, these tides uh, are most extraordinary. Uh, they occur only at rare intervals. But under some conditions, it is possible to walk dry shod as far as seven miles out from the normal shoreline. There are very rare tides of this kind. These were the types of tides which in the Mediterranean area resulted finally, as is said, in Aristotle committing suicide because he could not explain them. In any event, uh, searchers for Atlantean vestiges have gone out at these low tides to look for sea. If the sea had concealed anything, six, seven, eight miles off the coast of Spain, Human artifacts of a high order have been found. These artifacts are totally different from anything relating to the historical background of Spanish archaeology. They represent uh, symbols, figures, designs, mostly in bronze and ancient metals. And it is now estimated, therefore, that these bronze remains must be as old, if not older, than what we call the Cro-Magnon today. Yet we have no record that he worked in bronze. It would be incredible to us that he did. In the Sahara Desert have been dug up examples of tempered bronze, tempered so successfully that, it, uh, that a real cutting edge could be achieved, a strong edge, a useful edge. Yet the tempering of copper has only been discovered in comparatively recent times. The uh, Ancient evidences of these arts and sciences, the relics of them, would correspond somewhat with Plato's accounts and with those of other early writers, for it has been assumed for a long time that the Atlanteans did master the use of bronze, and that in some ways the tipping of the Bronze Age, as it was called, into the Age of Iron had symbolic bearing upon the destruction of their continent. All of these uh, relics, however, are not as uh, really interesting to us as, for example, we know from ancient mythology that among the kings of Atlantis there was one that ruled a state on the extreme eastern end of that continent. And in the old mythological records he is called Gades. And he was one of the members of the family of Atlas. Gades is remaining to us. 
We know who Gades is now, or what Gades is. It is the city of Cadiz in Spain, named for him. He was an Atlantean king. How did the Spanish city come to pick up this legend? Why do we also find in the area around this city extraordinary examples of volcanic upheaval and evidences of ancient culture far earlier than anything to be discovered in more distant parts of the same country? Bit by bit, these things have to be fitted together. But all the fitting tells us one thing, that somewhere in the background there were many myths many legends which have resulted in the naming of ancient areas and that this naming of ancient areas seems to show a broad knowledge of something uh, some years ago a man named Preston in his work are in um, the Great Pyramid a book on the Great Pyramid New Light on the Great Pyramid I guess his name was Parson not Preston but in any event, he brings into his book something that is quite intriguing. He shows a map of the world, the astronomical map, laid on the terrestrial map. He makes his contact by tying the celestial constellation of the Nile with the terrestrial Nile, assuming that at some remote period, the heavenly map and the earthly map coincided, following an ancient belief. Uh, that there is, they say, a flower in the field for every star in the sky, but more particularly, these great land areas. If you fit the celestial map over the terrestrial map, as the Chinese did in their famous bronze uh, terrasphere on the wall of the observatory in Peking, which was taken to Berlin after the Boxer Rebellion, but later returned, you find that the heavens placed upon the earth give us some very interesting things in the line of correspondences. If we do that, the constellation of the Great Bear falls over Russia. Why? No, no. The constellation of the Eagle falls over the United States. The great constellation Serpians falls over Central America, where the worship of the serpent has been noted for ages. All parts of this terrestrial celestial correspondence map seems to indicate that the creators of the star groups had some kind of a knowledge of geography, that they were not unaware uh, that there were land areas, and that at some prehistoric time these land areas had been reached or charted. How, we do not know. We know also that Plutarch, in his voyages, describes a Greek expedition. The description, the detail of this description of navigation was analyzed mathematically in terms of the sailing of boats. The uh, modern analysis was made within the last 50 years to try to find out from the detailed description left by the ancient Greek navigators where they had gotten to, allowing for their own measurements of how many equivalents to our miles they sail in one direction, then for so many days in another direction, and following exactly as far as possible not only their course but at the end, what they found. It would seem that these Greek navigators at a very ancient time navigated as far as the St. Lawrence River and went up that river, perhaps as far as a boat could go. That they were, and then also traveled down the coast of America. We have no authentic records of this except this record which was then held to be purely mythological. But taking the charts and measuring the journey, it seems that they reached that area. Now we have no way of knowing what others have done. This whole idea that this half of the world was unknown depends entirely upon our own concept. Now what kind of a people 
must we assume these Atlanteans to have been? Here we go into a whole group of possible explanations. From the standpoint of the diffusion of peoples and the remnants that today seem to bear witness to this ancient motion, we are apparently in the presence of a Mongolian people, what we would term something between the Egyptian and the American Red Indian, the Mongolian of China and Siberia. He seems to belong to this group of people. Therefore, it would be interesting to discover, if possible, where Mongolian blood can be found in Europe. Of course, we know approximately where to look for it, but this is a comparatively late mixture. We know that the host of Genghis Khan brought Mongolian blood uh, to the back door of Europe, certainly as far as the Slavic countries, and that he and his descendants during the 12th and 13th centuries scattered Mongolian blood throughout Eastern Europe. But we also have a lot of other things to think about, namely the evidence that increases constantly that in the remote background practically every European stock has Mongolian blood. We don't like to go into it too much in detail, but there is evidence of Mongolian blood in Ireland. In the so-called 100% German Aryan, he is loaded with it. It is even quite abundant in uh, the Latin peoples. It is present in Spain. And it is quite uh, evident that it commixes in North Africa, producing a whole series of mixtures. Of course, it is all through Asia, so that Mongolian blood is to be found on both sides of the Western Hemisphere. And, of course, your American Indian also is a strong Mongolian, a point that has never been questioned. This diffusion, therefore, of ancient peoples and the fact that these strains are consistently being submerged in most European countries, and that these strains go back much further than we generally believe. In fact, it is believed rather historically that the historical man we know as Odin in Scandinavia came from Scythia, and that he came as an Asiatic to Scandinavia. The Greeks claim that their Orpheus was an Asiatic. And the Egyptians say that their Osiris came originally from India. So all these things go back. And as we go back behind the rise of the great Anglo-Saxon Teuton complex of peoples, we find underneath, holding them up, this mysterious Mongolian atlas who holds modern humanity on its shoulders. More research is necessary in this field, but the belief in general has long been that what we call our Atlantean was perhaps nearer to the Mongol than any other type that we know today. That therefore the possibility of his disappearing as a great unit of culture in the uh, Atlantic Ocean era, or the Atlantic region, may well have released minority groups as the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons and the Aryan Semites from what had previously been subservience. That it was the loss of these master powers that gave a tremendous incentive to the rise of European culture for which also we have no reasonable explanation. We simply do not know. The Druids had two colleges in France. These colleges, one of which was the great school of Bibractus, taught so much of learning that it was to the amazement of Caesar. The Romans had nothing comparing to the great universities of the Druids. These universities, however, have vanished from all memory, apparently. They disappeared. But what they taught 
came from very ancient sources. And we know that such doctrines as rebirth and evolution were known to the Druids. In fact, they borrowed money in one life and gave a receipt promising to pay it back in the next, which indicates a very high a degree of faith, particularly on the part of the individual who accepted the note. <laughs> Today, we trace most of these beliefs to Asia. Now, we have another problem that's a, a rather pretty and subtle one. Assuming uh, that uh, Asia attained a comparatively high cultural level at an early period, and your Indian records might assume it, we must then uh, explain our Elysian, uh, our Aleutian Straits migrations and our Bering Sea migrations. At what time according to the conservative men of the field, did this migration from Asia take place that was to populate the Western Hemisphere with its traditional red man? We have to look carefully. This migration must have occurred before Asia attained a cultural platform which we associate with its classical era. Had it attained its classical definition, it would have brought this information with it and would not have left the entire North American hemisphere as far as the Mexican border without a calendar. It couldn't have happened. These things would have come along. And also many doctrines would have advanced much more uh, completely and we would not have had a great culture like Asia producing a nomadic culture like uh, our North American Indians. Therefore, our American Indian possesses the rudiments of Asiatic shamanism, but he does not possess it in a highly developed form. Therefore, he has to have brought it, the primitive part, with him, and had to have left the homeland before the more highly advanced part was, was known to his own people. Then cut off, theoretically, he could have been forced to grow slowly achieving over a period of perhaps several thousand years the final culture which he attained in the Great Iroquois League. If the Iroquois League lasted for 50 years longer, Europe could not have conquered America. This situation uh, points out something else. Down further along our shores, in the Mexican Taltec Aztec Maya complex, we have an entirely different people, structurally and racially. Here we have a people with a great culture, a culture that confounded Montezuma and left the early Jesuits that accompanied him speechless and caused them finally to reform their own calendar from that of Mexico. Here was a people that did not wander across the Bering Straits or the Elysian Island chain. These people came with an achievement. Had they migrated, they would have left their records from Alaska to Mexico, but they did not. Migration could not have been rapid enough in those days for them not to have left long, enduring records the entire length of our coast. They didn't. They say themselves they didn't come from there. They say that they came from an entirely different area. They came from the east. If they came from the East, they did not come from any nation that we know of in historic time. And yet we have every reason from their calendar to assume that they rose in ancient time from a very highly civilized group. They were not Egyptians. They were not Phoenicians. They were not Assyrians, Chaldeans, or Babylonians. And certainly, they were not Irishmen. They came from an entirely different cultural stream. This great Central American civilization arrived in this continent building cities, raising temples, creating buildings 2,000 feet long, pyramids with such perfect drainage that if you spill a glass of water at the top, it'll go directly to the bottom, orienting them as perfectly as the Egyptian pyramid. Yet they were not Egyptian. They were something else. 
they had a homeland. And a homeland which was rich in arts, rich in cultures. They came from the east, from great cities. Go back and figure the time when they came from, from there. Along for the conservative concept of modern archaeologists. One thing is evident. They did not come from Europe since the Roman Empire. Or someone would have remembered them. Someone would have noted it. No people strong enough to have produced the great empire of Mayapan could have detached itself from the Italy of the Medicis or the Rome of the Caesars and not been remembered. We might say they could have come from some other area such as Gaul. But at that time, these people were dressed in the skins of animals. They were not your Naya Empire. They could not have come in the days between the rise of the Roman uh, kingdoms, 600 B.C. They did not come from Greece. There's nothing remotely Grecian about them. They speak no language that is known in the old world. They use no alphabet from Europe, yet they came from the east. Where? They tell us distinctly that they did come from the East. There is no other explanation for them. There is no trace of them coming down our Western Americas. They certainly didn't come from Patagonia. There is nothing that tells us that they could have come directly from Asia. They tell us themselves that they came from the East. Their great hero god, later, to follow the pattern, came from the east, from the land of the seven colors. Later, when Cortes came from the east, they declared him to be their god returned because he had followed the same route as their ancient peoples. These things tell us that this people arose somewhere this side of Europe and the far side of Mexico. They didn't come from the Azores. They were not the people of Madeira, and they certainly were not the ancient inhabitants of the West Indies. Where did they come from? Seemingly, we have no record. Within historic time, they did not come from Africa. They have none of the blood stream. The stream. How did they get where they got? There seems to be one point that is made out of this, that some cultural center existed that could produce a people that could build a city like Chichen Itza, in which the public buildings are some of them five miles apart. It is estimated that the city of Chichen Itza, if laid out architecturally and completed according to the existing remains, would have been large enough to house three million people. Where did they come from? They tell us. But we have to deny it because we can't find the land they spoke of, even though they tell us it's Agnes. But if we can imagine from their calendars that they did move in, they moved in already rich. They moved in upon a previous people, aboriginal. And we have the same situation here that we had in other parts of the world. Two layers of culture, one built upon the other, like the Aryas of India moving down into the Dravidian culture of the Indo-Gangetic plain. These things move, and they move from the west, uh, from the east to the west, through some region, some area unknown. That these people could have navigated a distance is true. That a whole civilization moved the entire width of the Atlantic is unlikely. The lands of mud must once have been there. Now the strange glory of the great Western culture, the cities which they built, have in some way fired the imagination of many thinkers to assume that this whole mode of architecture, this whole psychology of life, was the shadow, the dying remnant of the Atlantean. That another remnant of this, moving in the opposite direction and striking the Mediterranean culture resulted in Egypt, but that these two forks had already separated. Therefore, in certain things there is a common heritage. In other things, however, there is no heritage. 
Both use glyphs, but the glyphs cannot be completely deciphered in terms of each other. There are reminiscences, but there are differences. It is quite possible that the uh, Western culture, the magnificent city of Mexico described by Cortez, the city that was a fairyland of beauty, and yet a city in which a strange warlikeness, human sacrifice, and all these things abounded, could well have been the remnant of this decadent Atlantean culture which was wiped out for its cruelties. We do not know, but the dream moves in that direction. The thinking seems to tell us that there was this central core there. If this existed, as by reasonable hypothesis, then we know that the people who reached the Western Hemisphere sometime, perhaps between the beginning of the Christian era and 1,000 years before that, that that period in there, that these people reached this Western Hemisphere from the remnants and vestiges of something, and there are reports and records to be found that would indicate that parts of the Antilles, as we call it, parts of the area around the West Indian group were submerged, the parts were submerged comparatively recently. There is indication that in the area which we call the Sagasso Sea at the present time, the graveyard of ships, that there were large areas which were not submerged until uh, well within the period of history that these submergences may have been as late as 1,000 to 2,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. And it's possible that these formed parts of the land bridges that carried these people from some unknown homeland of still earlier vintage. Here again, then, if we posit our Atlantean, as we find him in Plato, assuming him to have existed some 12,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era, and in this period, coming to the conclusion of his culture, what is behind him? We must assume that behind him was a long history. And this is also implied, but not analyzed by Plato. These people had to rise. They had to come to authority and power. Again, they had to be taught by gods and heroes of a still more ancient time. What we probably have not recognized and have never given serious consideration to is that man has been, has been on this earth much longer than even the most optimistic anthropologist believes. That there have been many cultures, but that the natures of these cultures were such that for some of them at least, surviving artifacts might be comparatively rare. We have reasons to assume, for example, uh, if we can believe our studies of anatomy and physiology, that primitive man may have lived here as a comparatively rational being without leaving architectural remains. That's something we've never taken into consideration at all. Namely, that what we call our stream of culture, which has largely been a stream marked by monuments. Wherever we have gone, we've left a monument, whether it was the pyramid or Stonehenge. Wherever we have gone, we have also left carved bones, inscribed rocks, uh, human remains in some cultural form. This represents, however, a direction of energy. It is quite possible that man could have existed, as the legends tell us, at a time when these things were not necessary that he could have had an entirely different orientation, and that this orientation was lost to him by what is called symbolically the fall. That this fall may also have historical meaning, that it represents not necessarily the punishment of a crime, but a reorganization of man's powers, possibly going back and this may psychologically have great importance in the course of time, to the beginning at which apparently the human being, together with most other creatures of nature, was hermaphrodite. That it was not until the division of the sexes that the intellectual polarization of man began to force him into an objective condition. This is indicated by most of the scriptural writings of the world. That therefore there came a time when man, who had been a peculiarly complete creature, 
and being complete did not suffer from the psychosis which we call the need for civilization had an entirely different way of fulfilling the consciousness instincts of his own nature particularly if we wish to assume as the Tibetan does that in a remote time he possessed an internal organ of orientation by means of which he had the power of direct knowing and that this power of direct knowing lies at the root uh, giving or bestowing the primordial impulse by means of which all motion of knowledge as we know it had its origin if this being possessed knowing as Buddha points out he would not have done in that state what man does now in the first place our entire motion has been toward knowledge and toward security so survival and wisdom have been the supreme quest of man since the dawn of the motions of civilization as we know them had man at some ancient time possessed wisdom and known security beyond any question of doubt he would have been and remained static in that state something had to happen something had to unbalance man's internal psychic faculty equilibrium making it suddenly necessary for him to follow the admonition of Genesis to go forth and to earn his bread with the sweat of his brow something had to drive him out of the paradisical region which was perhaps his primordial home it is quite possible therefore that man different of appearance different of structure different of texture but still the seed from which modern man was to come at some remote time possessed a total internal awareness and that this total internal awareness has retired to become his unconscious and that what we call evolution or growth today is this internal awareness breaking through slowly as a result of the gradual retirement uh, refinement of certain organs certain structures which for thousands of years have inhibited the expression of this internal totality Plato intimates as much so does Hesiod in his Theogony these possible explanations might also explain how and why the Atlantean mystery was possible in Atlantis how at a remote time a culture which according to Plato once lived at peace and according to law suddenly became lawless as a result of its lawlessness certain things happened Cain the fratricide after he had slain his brother went forth and became the builder of cities this has never been exactly understand it could well be that it was the destruction of certain psychic content or the suppression of it which suddenly sent man desperately into the course he now knows the course that has left behind it 7,000 years of historical empires rising falling disappearing and with all of this man remaining essentially insecure had it been possible to assume this we might then postulate that the Atlantis of Plato and the Atlantis of the demigods of mythology the Atlantis with its huge monolithic monumental remains scattered about the earth that this Atlantis was the product itself of a very long period of conditioning that by degrees as Plato says here war was first discovered here men first disobeyed that gradually in the course of the primordial development of a kind of specialized life on this planet man passed out of instinctive control such as was possessed by animals but probably a higher and more intuitive form of it and passed into this state in which he had to depend upon submerged intuition and this submerged intuition became instinct and he began to seek around him for the things that were really within him and once he started this we can understand why civilization galloped on its way 
like some mysterious uh, symbolic centaur with the head and shoulders of a man and the body of a horse. This uh, civilization, therefore, represents a special condition arising, making possible the gradual accumulation of artifacts. Prior to this, there may have been a being that needed no artifacts. As surely as there existed upon the earth in those days countless creatures, in addition to those whose fossilized remains are known to us. Only certain type of creatures could leave fossils. These did, but there were other forms that did not. The nature of man is not known for any of this vast background, and we do not seem to be catching up to him very rapidly. Thus, out of a long, dim background, the rise of an Atlantean culture can be hypothecated. We can see it emerging until it finally reaches a tremendous achievement. Now, the destruction of Atlantis may or may not be regarded as a moral incident. It is, in, it is quite conceivable that this destruction went on over an incredible period of time, that perhaps at times the continent increased in size, at other times it decreased. A considerable piece of the coast of Chile disappeared in our own lifetimes. It made a couple of inches in the newspaper, that was all. We have no um, interest in these minor changes, unless we happen to live in them. But the changes are continuously happening. Our eastern seaboard is changing constantly with a tendency to slowly submerge. It will not happen in our time or in our descendants' time. But if we look back upon this continent a hundred thousand years from now, it probably will not have the present shape. It is assumed as possible from existing conditions that a thousand and a hundred thousand years from now our Pacific coast will be inland. Here is an opportunity for further subdivision. <laughs> but all these changes are forever happening. They happened in Atlantis. The continent was constantly differing in the formation and distribution of its allotments. But slowly out of it, there appears to have come a pattern of seven, some say ten islands. And that these islands, including a comparatively large region, Posidonis, remain for a long time perhaps are suffering from problems not dissimilar from the Japanese to the Japanese islands, where population problems are acute, and where the peoples attempted to escape to the mainland in the colonization of Manchuria and helped to precipitate a very difficult political situation. What is going to happen to the Dutch East Indies? Who cares about Java unless you happen to be a Javanese? And yet, at the moment, Java is the most densely populated area on the face of the earth, averaging 700 persons to the square mile for the entire island. What are we going to do with these people? They're increasing constantly. There may have been great problems of that kind that we know nothing about long ago. The migrations of these peoples over great periods of time, and finally, the destruction of the great capital center, which was still the homeland of all these people. Imagine Atlantis spreading out and casting a vast empire, ruled over as was the British Empire, by a small group of islands. This island kingdom, this center, by its gradual destruction and its ultimate sudden annihilation, if we sit down and study it, analyze the possibility of migrations from Atlantis, perhaps covering a hundred thousand years or a million years, moving into various other areas, meeting ultimately with further later migrations of their own peoples, mingling with primitive or pre-Atlantean groups existing. Here we have a tremendously complicated history, a history that could touch a thousand nations in a thousand different ways, bringing one thing to one people and one to another. Some of these groups, like the American Indians, might have migrated from their homeland before the rise of Atlantean culture, so that little but myth, legend, and bloodstream remained. 
Others may have been among the last, and the first and the last meeting may have slain each other because they no longer recognize any kinship. It is all a very confusing and fantastic situation. And out of it arises a little isolated community like the Basques between France and Spain. People without a history, with an unknown language, with a completely and totally isolated culture, surviving. Other groups of a similar nature are to be found in other places, as in the Nilgiri Hills of India. Here we have also records on our, Amer on our Latin American coast, particularly in northern parts of South America, of blonde, blue-eyed Indians who flourished there three or four thousand years ago. Who were they? Examination of their skulls remains most discomforting. Their brain capacity was equal to ours. Where did they come from? No one knows. We have to place behind our present anthropological and ethnological concept some proven pattern of human motion in a dark period before history. We cannot have nothing back there but the missing link. We cannot have nothing there but a hairy human anthropoid giving birth out of his own wisdom to Greek philosophers. <laughs> there has to be something. And this something has to be a bridge that is strong, long, old, and important. It has to show thousands of years of traditional culture within itself. Even if the Atlantic theory or Atlantis theory of Plato does only one thing for us, that thing, it seems to me, may ultimately be more than sustained, although we speak only from reason and not from fact. Namely, that we have got to be prepared to discover ancient cultures, prehistoric cultures, that can explain our present achievements. We also, perhaps, will learn from them the key to the riddle of our own. And we will discover, perchance, how it happened that we took the course that has led us into this strange and difficult procedure. We may also discover where certain basic errors crept in, where we followed false motions, and in so doing, have built false foundations. By so doing, by studying, by analyzing and observing, we might even be able to restore, ultimately, the primitive purpose of man, which is now lost to us. But here was for the primitive man with a purpose and no way of attaining it. And here is a modern man with every means of attainment at his disposal and no purpose. These tremendous intervals, these inconsistencies must be reconciled. And to do it, we must have a new concept of the human race. And if the Atlantis theory opens to us the possibilities of this new concept, even though the stories we now have may be many of them incorrect, if they reveal a line of thought that may unfold for us the origin of our species and leave us free from this terrible belief that a few thousand years ago we were untutored savages hunting for fire and recognize that the man that we know on earth today is the product of vast periods of growth unfold, and that nature has concentrated this effort for a reason. And to attain this reason, we must not be like the lemmings who simply swim out into the sea and drown, because they always have. Man makes mistakes because he always has. Always has. This he cannot afford to do. I'm making a mistake now. It's two minutes past time, but I always have made the mistake, so you'll excuse me if you do it on this page. Now, I'd like to, before you uh, leave, I'd like to call...